Vielleicht äh, zunächst auf Deutsch weiter, ähm, die, äh, um, um auch anzudeuten, dass die Veranstaltung durchaus zweisprachig intendiert ist. Ähm, wir werden eine Diskussion an den Vortrag äh, von Herrn Jarosch anschließen, die, äh, die wir auf Englisch und auf Deutsch führen können und auch hin und her springen, je nachdem. Keiner sollte sich ähm, sollte zurückhalten oder, oder das Gefühl haben, die eine oder andere Sprache verwenden zu müssen. Ähm, und ansonsten werde ich das meine dazu tun, äh, möglichst die uns alle im, im Zeitrahmen zu halten, weil wir alle das Phänomen der Zoom-Fatigue kennen und ähm, ich niemanden über äh, die Maßen strapazieren möchte. Aber ich möchte auch äh, an, beginnen damit, dass ich meinen Dank vor allem an Karin Goel ausdrücke und die vielen Mitarbeiterinnen am äh, äh, berlin Program und äh, äh, an der FU, äh, die, die das äh, Programm tragen, ähm, aufrechterhalten ähm, und auch äh, so lebendig erhalten haben über diese vielen, vielen Jahre jetzt, die das Programm schon existiert, dass es wirklich eine Institution geworden ist, an der man sich orientiert und die jetzt auch diese, diese, diesen Vortrag äh, jeden Sommer mit sich bringt. Als letztes sage ich noch, wie leid es mir tut, dass wir äh, diesen Vortrag nicht mit, der gewöhnlichen, mit dem gewöhnlichen Empfang verbinden können. Es wäre sehr, sehr schön, wenn wir uns jetzt alle in Dahlem zusammenfinden könnten und ein Gläschen äh, auf den Redner erheben könnten und vielleicht den einen oder anderen auch, äh, der noch zu ehren sein wird. Ähm, aber das müssen wir vertagen. Äh, jetzt gebe ich erst weiter für einen Willkommensgruß an äh, Herrn äh, Herbert Grieshopp, der der Leiter der Abte Abteilung Internationales ist und damit das äh, Berlin-Programm unter sich hat an der FU. Herr Grieshopp, Sie müssen sich erst entstuhlen. Yes. And I, I'm going to switch to English. Yeah, I'm going to switch to English. So my name is Herbert Griesop. I'm the Director of International Affairs at Freie Universität Berlin. And as you can see, I sit actually in my office and I can see from you, some of you sit at home, quite a few sit at home, some sit in their offices. So we are a mixed bunch as we are every day now. For those of you who are not familiar with the Berlin program here, for the Berlin Program for Advanced German and European Studies. Let me say a few words. I don't think there are many who don't know the program, but most of you know it. Uh, it's a program that exists since 1986. We have funded more than 360 projects, uh, mainly doctoral projects, but also a lot of postdoctoral projects. Fellows spent two semesters here at Freie Universität to carry out their research programs, and we fund programs in the social sciences, in the social sciences and in the humanities for, for people who study Germany and or Europe. And I think that's all I want to say at this point, because I think most of the people who are here uh, know what this is about. Um, the, this particular lecture is the eighth in the series that was started in 2013 with a lecture by David Barclay, but I will come to back, back to that at the end of the lecture. And today it's just a pleasure for me to welcome Konrad Jarausch, who I'm sure many of you know and who's uniquely qualified to shed light on today's topic, Embattled Europe, a Progressive Alternative. And in order to introduce Konrad Jarausch, I will hand over to GCSA Executive Director David Buckley, who will introduce the speaker for tonight. David. Thank you, Herbert. Guten Morgen, guten Abend, je nachdem, wo ihr seid. Ich heiße David Barclay, bin seit 2005 Executive Director der German Studies Association. The German Studies Association has had a long and very, very fruitful relationship, as Herbert just noted, with the Freie Universität Berlin, um, particularly through our co-sponsorship of the Berlin Program for Advanced German and European Studies. I have the pleasure today of introducing our GSA Distinguished Lecturer this year, and of course he can hardly be more distinguished. Uh, Konrad Jarausch is Lursi Professor of European Civilization at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And quite in the spirit of both the GSA and the Freie Universität, he has spent a lifetime mediating between our two continents. His connections to the 
Berlin-Brandenburg area run very deep, among other things, through his many years of association with the Zentrum für Zeithistorische Forschung in Potsdam and his participation over many years on the Berlin Program Advisory Committee. And of course, uh, as noted, he has himself served as president of the GSA. Uh, he has authored or edited about 50 books, uh, most recently a large study of modern recent European history and an account of how ordinary Germans experienced the last century. About two centuries ago, Goethe wrote, quote, Amerika, du hast es besser als unser Kontinent, das Alte. Hardly anyone would seriously make such a claim today. A day after the United States reported 60,000 new COVID cases in one day. George Packer, author of an important biography of Richard Holbrook, co-founder of the American Academy in Berlin, has recently described the United States in his own words as a failed state. Must we now paraphrase Goethe and say something different, something like, Europa hat es wirklich besser als unser Land regiert vom Schwätzer. I can think of no one more qualified to reflect on these matters than our distinguished lecturer today, Konrad Jarausch. Konrad? Perhaps while Konrad sets up his um, uh, PowerPoint slides, I can encourage everybody to uh, take advantage of the technology and feel free to uh, enter questions and queries as they come to you in the chat. You don't have to wait until the talk is over. I'll be, I'll be noting it and then trying to do a little traffic control there. But if you have questions that you'd like to pose uh, in the course of the presentation, please feel free to just uh, put them in the chat. Konrad, you're still muted. Unmute. There we go. Okay. Dear Johannes, uh, Herbert, David, Helga, Paul, and Karin, it is really a great pleasure to present this year's distinguished lecture since I have been involved in the Berlin program and in the German Studies Association for several decades. I would like to share with you today my concerns about what I think is a transatlantic crisis by tracing the development of Europe during the last three decades in a kind of quick overview. If some of my comments appear provocative, they are prompted by the urgent need to repair some of the current damage. Now let me begin. To a large part of the American public, Europe has become, quote, a dirty word, unquote. Even respectable Republicans echo Mitt Romney's campaign promise, quote, I do not want to become more like Europe, unquote, while the alt-right is promoting a visceral fear of socialism so as to defend American exceptionalism and encourage anti-EU populism in Europe. President Trump's call to make America great again is also predicated on seeing the European Union as the enemy, which has cheated the United States in trade and freeloaded in defense. The conservative media have been predicting the strange death of Europe, such is the title of a book, even if that has refused to happen. In the rightist discourse, Europe has become a symbol for everything it detests. However, for more liberal Americans, Europe has nonetheless retained some of its allure as holiday destination, trading partner, or political alternative. Before the corona crisis, transatlantic airlines continued to be full of vacation travelers and backpacking students looking forward to taking in the sites, and I have to, can you see the PowerPoint? No? No? Not yet. 
Okay, then I will have to do another share screen. Okay. There it is. Is it okay? And now we do it from the beginning. Okay. And seeing the sites like St. Mark's Square in Venice. Moreover, the business class was usually occupied by managers shuttling to continental subsidiaries or consulting European headquarters of companies in the United States. But the politicians of the left, like Bernie Sanders and moderates like Joe Biden, the European way still suggests some progressive policy alternatives, which if adopted could improve the lives of many Americans. To the, resolve this contradiction with somewhat more reliable information, this, reflect, this reflection attempts what is called a history of the present, Gegenwartsgeschichte, that goes beyond journalistic snapshots by putting current events into a longer time frame. That, of course, is quite difficult when the outcome isn't known yet and if the archival record is not accessible. Nonetheless, I think a systematic review of public debates can provide a more stable perspective that differentiates short-range panics from longer structural trends. Some of the sources are speeches and interviews as well as commentary in the leading media. And of course, I've been living on both sides of the Atlantic for over six decades. And some of this uh, goes into what I have to say. On the one hand, this intervention seeks to reaffirm Europe's promise, another book title, as a reasonable alternative to Trumpist populism. Though both sides share values such as human rights, democracy, and capitalism, their implementation is increasingly diverging. In contrast to the Americans' frequent resort to military force, most Europeans believe in peaceful diplomacy and multilateralism. Unlike the neoliberal American faith in competition, Europe tries to curb financial speculation so as to avoid periodic crashes. While social inequality is widening in America, this gap is somewhat limited by a welfare state on the continent. Many Europeans therefore live more satisfying lives according to criteria ranging from health insurance to gun control. On the other hand, my comments intend to encourage the Europeans themselves to redouble efforts to safeguard their own model against globalized competition. The negative stereotype of what is called Brussels bureaucracy, as well as the current crisis rhetoric have undercut much of the progress of integration. And then there are illiberal populists like the Hungarian Viktor Orban, who are eroding human rights and opposing common solutions to questions like migration. Some concerned intellectuals have therefore issued a manifesto for a European Republic, quote, it is time to turn the promise inherent in Europe into a reality, unquote, so that, quote, a common market and a common currency can be created within a common European democracy, unquote. Now, let me go to the substance of my talk in four steps. With the lifting of the Iron Curtain, the European future looked quite bright in 1989-90. The overthrow of communism in Eastern Europe ended the Cold War and forced the Red Army to withdraw, leading to the implosion of the Soviet Union. This peaceful revolution initiated an exciting transition to democracy and capitalist former satellite states. Concurrently, Western European integration picked up speed and eventually included most of Eastern Europe in NATO and the EU. After half a century of near warfare, the end of ideological confrontation and the reunification of Germany finally offered all Europeans a chance to live in peace, freedom, and prosperity. 
How did this opportunity come about? What obstacles did it have to overcome? And what consequences did it involve? The downfall of communism in Europe in 1989 was simply the most important caesura after the end of the Second World War, since it ended the Cold War and liberated Eastern Europe from Soviet control. It was both a collapse from above and an overthrow from below, because without the erosion of party resolve and the courage of dissidents, the peaceful contestation could not have succeeded. A rather improbable constellation brought communism to its knees. A climate of detente encouraged attempts at party reform, which allowed dissidents to demand human rights and ordinary people to flee for a better life. Since both sides were willing to talk, the result was a, quote, negotiated, unquote, or pacted, quote, revolution that allowed a return to democracy. In spite of the nonviolent transfer of power, the European upheaval was a real revolution that overturned politics, economic society, and culture. According to the political theorist Jack Goldstone, the quote, color revolution, unquote, in Eastern Europe, quote, unfolded as a series of moderate confrontations between crowds engaged in peaceful demonstrations and powerful authoritarian states that had lost confidence to defend themselves. The latter conceded power to the opposition or negotiated a change of regime, unquote. In this definition, the East European upheavals qualify as revolutions since they fundamentally changed the political system, replaced planning with a market economy, re-stratified society and ended cultural censorship. Even if the transition was negotiated, these changes were revolutionary. Virtually all the participants underestimated the enormity of the transformation which overthrow which the overthrow of communism would entail. In politics, the shift involved the transition from a late socialist welfare dictatorship to a parliamentary democracy. In economics, it meant a change from a faltering planned economy to a competitive form of market capitalism. In international affairs, it signaled the end of Soviet hegemony and the re-emergence of nation states in the former bloc. Many commentators underrated the adjustment from a party-dominated collectivist Marxism to a person-centered individualism. No wonder that these multiple transitions proved both liberating and unsettling. Only novelists like Svetlana Alexievich have been able to portray what these changes meant to people caught up in them. Though the East European mood has become less celebratory, supporters maintain that, quote, the great transformation, unquote, was largely a, quote, success story, unquote. In politics, the restoration of civil rights created new opportunities for self-government, even if democratization was difficult. In economics, the reintroduction of a competitive market ended the stagnation of the plan with growth spurts that closed the gap to Western living standards. In society, the rejection of collectivism opened up space for individual choices, and in culture, the end of censorship reconnected Eastern Europe to international debates and global pop culture. As a result, the cities of the former Soviet satellites have become vibrant places with impressive prosperity and creativity. At the same time, European integration has made further progress, both in deepening and widening the EU. Still far from a nation state, the integration project appears both fragile and resilient, full of crises and full of further advances, like the free travel in the Schengen space. Its tri triple structure of supranational shared and reserved policy fields suggests a tenuous compromise between supranationalism and intergovernmentalism moderated by the principle of, su principle of subsidiarity. Strong in community law and market competition, 
the union remains weak in foreign policy, defense, and social policy, though it tries to add competence whenever a new problem appears. As a hybrid form of cooperation that both strengthens and surpasses its member states, the EU remains an unfinished project. Belying the popular rhetoric of doom, the transformation of Europe since 1990 has been nothing short of astounding. Though the transition to democracy has been more painful than expected, on the whole, it has brought Eastern Europe more freedom than before. Shedding decades of economic stagnation has required enormous effort and massive aid to narrow the gap to the West. No doubt the simultaneous deepening and widening of the European Union has produced many strains and disappointed some hopes for perfect democracy and consumer prosperity. But at the beginning of the 21st century, most Europeans had ample reason to look with optimism into a better future. Just when everything seemed to be going well, and this is my second point, a veritable avalanche of crises descended upon the European Union that threw its viability into doubt. Starting in the US, the financial collapse endangered the solvency of indebted Mediterranean countries, as well as the survival of the Euro as a transnational currency. Then, a tidal wave of African and Middle Eastern refugees washed up upon the continental shores, straining the capacity and willingness to help since fears of losing cultural identity sparked xenophobic resentment. Finally, the exit of a previously ambivalent United Kingdom from the EU after a referendum demonstrated the resurgence of nationalism. What were the causes of these reverses? What was their impact? And how have the Europeans managed to deal with them? Throughout the sovereign debt crisis, journalists, economists, and politicians predicted the imminent collapse of the Euro and triggered, for instance, a run on Greek ATMs. In 2012, Martin Feldstein drastically claimed, quote, the Euro should now be recognized as an experiment that failed, unquote. This was not the result of, quote, bureaucratic mismanagement, but rather the inevitable consequence of imposing a single currency on a very heterogeneous group of countries, end quote. Because the Euro was based on the political decision to harness German power to European integration, it was far from, quote, an optimum currency area, unquote, since, quote, the EU lacks the will, the ideas, and the capacity to promote the euro, unquote. Athens could only save itself by Brexit, leaving the eurozone. And in spite of so many dire forecasts, the Europe has miraculously survived. Though correct on the delayed response to the sovereign debt, Doomsayers underestimated the commitment to integration and misunderstood the bargaining process. The vacillation of the European Central Bank and the EU Commission was frustrating as their reaction to the Eurozone crisis was a strategy of, quote, failing forward, unquote, with members only making minimal concessions. Moreover, the electorate and the fiscally sound countries resisted paying for the seeming profligacy of its neighbors. Quote, today this sequential cycle of piecemeal reform followed by policy failure, followed by further reform, has managed to sustain both the European project and the common currency, unquote. By frustrating tradingly slow, this decision-making process ultimately came up with enough compromises to rescue the common currency. At the same time, a throng of refugees created a migration crisis which overwhelmed all registration efforts at the border. This is a Malta boat rescue. Migration 
peaked in 2015 when 1.2 million applicants petitioned the EU for asylum, over one third of them in Germany alone. And the real figures are actually higher, but they're very controversial. And so I took lower ones. Previously, the Dublin system had required asylum seekers to register at their first entry point into the EU. But when numbers exploded, the border authorities in Italy and Greece failed to keep up, shifting the problem to destination countries like Germany and Sweden. Since asylum decisions were a national matter, EU efforts to coordinate policies and redistribute migrants made little headway, while the local authorities, as well as charitable NGOs, never had enough resources to care for all the migrants. As a result, right-wing backlash triggered restrictive responses from member states, as well as the EU as a whole. While the frontline countries clamored for aid from Brussels, the xenophobic Balkan states barricaded their frontiers, reducing registrations in Hungary, for instance, to a trickle. In Germany, Chancellor Merkel had great difficulty fending off attacks against her welcoming promise, we can manage that, unquote, from the xenophobic IFD, as well as her Bavarian coalition partner, the CSU. After years of dispute, EU leaders finally agreed to beef up Frontex, distribute migrants, at least voluntarily, and try to stop newcomers before they reach the continent with processing centers in Turkey and North Africa. Though late in coming and restrictive, this package was a step towards a European solution. Even more dangerous was the Brexit crisis that threatened the very survival of the EU by making one of the leading members abandon the Union. In contrast to the cosmopolitan optimism of the Remainers, the Leavers felt somehow threatened and abandoned. Woefully ignorant of the EU, they saw it through the tabloid headlines that decried the financial chaos and migration onslaught. One favorite cliche, repeated time and again, railed against the quote, fact that unelected bureaucrats have got power over what goes on in this country, unquote. Another frequent criticism was the lack of immigration control, since Britain was a small island that already had, quote, too many people, unquote. Taken together, such complaints added up to a British sense that, quote, we are losing our identity, unquote. Ironically, the Brexit shock seems, however, to have had the opposite effect on the EU from what was anticipated. Instead of beginning, quote, the disintegration of Europe, unquote, the remaining 27 countries were able to develop a common negotiating position and to stick to it, even in the vexing issue of the Irish border. At the same time, approval ratings of the EU and the member countries have noticeably improved to around 75% during the Brexit crisis. The threat of losing the unity and prosperity that had been achieved has apparently had a sobering effect on expressions of Europhobe sentiment. In contrast to predictions of doom, the cascade of financial chaos, migration crisis, and UK withdrawal has actually reinforced cooperation by showing Europeans what they stood to lose. Now on to the next point. In spite of all negative predictions, Europe is still functioning quite well, perhaps even better than the United States. Most Europeans can enjoy high-speed train service, low-cost education, or long vacations, while many Americans are stuck in traffic jams, have to pay high tuition, or work longer hours. Contrary to neoliberal complaints, Germany is highly competitive and has a huge trade surplus. Criticisms of social service fraud notwithstanding, 
Sweden enjoys a reinvigorated welfare system that creates more equal life chances. And in contrast to denials of global warming, Denmark has abandoned nuclear power and switched towards renewable energy. Why are these European countries more fortunate in such issues and what might Americans be able to learn from them? One of the continental strengths is the social market economy, which makes Germany as well as its neighbors competitive. In contrast to British preference for financial services, the Federal Republic remains rather production and export oriented. After the collapse of mass manufacturing, German companies have focused on the upper market segment, relying on quality and design. They have specialized in medium high tech, such as machine tools and luxury cars, making VW, and I know it's not a luxury car, uh, one of the biggest automakers of the world. This is an image of the Autostadt in Wolfsburg. At the same time, they have become leaders in green technology and alternate energy. While Berlin favors fiscal discipline due to its negative recollections of two inflations, it also supports a generous welfare state in order to help the underprivileged segment of society. In the Anglo-American media, this German model has provoked much criticism for unnecessarily slowing down growth. Neoliberal commentators argue that protections of employees against arbitrary firing create a rigid labor market. They also emphasize that the many regulations, as well as the layers of bureaucracy, inhibit risk taking. The quote, non market coordination supplemented by a generous system of welfare protection, unquote, makes German goods often rather expensive. Quote, extensive cross shareholdings, long term bank finance, and co determination, unquote, reduce the flexibility of the economy in responding to opportunities. In spite of such problems, Germany as the EU powerhouse remains one of the leading export nations and amasses an impressive balance of payment surplus. Another European strength is the quote, miraculous welfare machine, unquote, even if its cost is increasingly called into question by global competition. The difficulties of high wage countries competing with lower wage Asian rivals have fostered a neoliberal discourse that denounces the excesses of the welfare state. While a middle class tax revolt rejects the high level of taxation and insurance premiums, economists complain that this quote tax reg unquote creates quote strong disincentive effects on effective labor supply unquote. Neoliberal char experts charge that the bureaucratization of welfare has ballooned the public workforce and hampered innovation. A new consensus has emerged claiming, quote, that it is both necessary and possible to streamline the Swedish model while preserving its key elements, unquote. Welfare reform has therefore focused on long-term fiscal sustainability by shifting from maintaining income to activating labor policies. On the one hand, tax rates were reduced so as to stem capital flight into tax havens. The ensuing budget shortfalls forced cutbacks in benefits, lowering the payouts of unemployment insurance and limiting welfare payments to a basic level. On the other, states have also invested in activating labor market policies to retain, to restrain the jobless and uh, to retrain the jobless, sorry, and make it easier for women and immigrants to enter the labor force. Both changes were inspired by the belief that it was necessary to abandon a high level of income maintenance in favor of a speedy re-entry into work, even if on a lower wage level. Such reforms have not abolished, but rather refocused European welfare states.
A sign of European strength is its impressive response to climate change. Okay, I'm sorry, I forgot one of these slides. And there we go. Um, EU climatologists have ascertained that the decade from 2002 to 2011, quote, was the warmest on record in Europe as European land temperatures, 1.3 degrees Celsius warmer than the pre-industrial average, unquote. Heat waves have become more frequent and longer, drying up rivers and ruining crops through drought in Southern Europe. At the same time, increasing precipitation Expectation in the north has created flooding of towns and farms. During the last decades, changes like the rise of sea levels have become so extensive that many scientists now claim that the Earth has entered a new geological epoch called Anthropocene, in which human beings have actually begun to transform the global environment. Even if they have not always lived up to their own standards, the Europeans are on the right track in fighting global warming through reducing their carbon footprint. Due to Trump's denial, the EU is the only major actor pushing for cutting greenhouse gas emissions. Led by Greta Thunberg's Friday for Future, public opinion is solidly supportive since it considers environmental protection, quote, important to them personally, unquote. One challenge for Brussels is to get all EU members to improve recycling, reduce energy consumption, and avoid plastic packaging. Another task is to convince major polluters like China and the US to follow his example in combining economic growth with environmental protection. In the end, Europe has nonetheless responded effectively to the problems of competitiveness, welfare reform, and climate warming. Now the final point. The liberal democracies will only be able to master the unprecedented challenges around the globe if they once again work closely together. While American leadership has been faltering, the Europeans have not always overcome their national divisions either. The Russian annexation of Crimea and occupation of Eastern Ukraine, as well as the continuation of Muslim terrorism have revived the need for NATO. Similarly, an ugly populism is threatening self-government on both sides of the Atlantic, pushing politics to right-wing or left-wing extremism. Finally, Europe's role in the world remains unclear since the transatlantic relationship is moving ever closer towards divorce. How can the EU and the US put aside their quarrels and work together to address these global problems? American leaders have been frustrated by continental foot, foot dragging in response to security threats, not realizing that the reason was a fundamental difference in military cultures. While in European memory, war is immediate, devastating, and personally deadly. In American recollection, it is overseas, technological, and generally victorious. As a result, Washington has been more willing to employ force in Afghanistan and Iraq, while European NATO members have remained split on whether to support them. Resentment at the cost of global leadership fuels Trump's complaints about the inequality of military burden sharing. Though technology and resources have brought spectacular victories, excessive reliance on force has often lost the peace when confronted by sectarian antagonists. In contrast, most Europeans have developed a decided preference for employing soft power in order to achieve their objectives. As a result of their bloody history, they generally favor conflict resolution through diplomacy and economic incentives rather than the use of force. Unlike Washington's penchant for unilateralism, the Continentals try to work through international organizations like the UN or NATO, even if reaching compromise 
is an exasperating process. Except for some limited, limited interventions in former colonies, the Europeans prefer mediation, peacekeeping, and aid for reconstruction. Unfortunately, this non-confrontational approach has some risks of its own since dictators like Putin can count on European inaction when devising aggressive strategies. The media are also full of laments about the crisis of democracy predicting its imminent demise. Like the French Yellow Vests, many citizens feel buffeted by impersonal forces such as globalization or digitization over which they have little or no control. Party politics appear to be a theater played by politicians in the capital, supported by media that has little to do with the common folk. At time and again, engaged minorities call for direct action, bypassing the cumbersome structures of self-government. Emphasizing negative trends, the political scientist Colin Crouch has coined the concept of, quote, post-democracy, unquote, to predict its failure. However, the German theoretician Klaus von Weimar countered with the label of, quote, neo-democracy, unquote, to denote the possibility of increased participation. The impact of populism on democracy is ambivalent since it, quote, can work either as a threat to or as a corrective, unquote. In weakening dictatorships, like in late communism, popular mobilization can strengthen democratization through public liberalization, regime transition, and constitutional reform. But in weak democracies, populism can also hasten the erosion of self-government by diluting civil rights, undercutting representative institutions, and creating repressive systems that maintain only the shell of self-government. The nationalist regimes of Kaczynski in Warsaw or Orban in Budapest or Babis in Prague are examples of the dangers of populist degeneration. It is this fear of de-democratization which right-wing movements like the Yellow Vests have been inspiring during the last decade. At the same time, the transatlantic relationship has been eroding since both partners are, quote, drifting apart, as I've argued, due to diverging interpretations of shared values. Most people on both sides of the Atlantic believe in free elections, a fair judiciary, and an unbiased media. But for Americans, freedom means, quote, to pursue life goals without state interference, unquote, while Europeans think that the, quote, state guarantees that nobody is in need, unquote. In the US, people claim that the path to personal success leads through individual effort, whereas on the continent, folks are more conscious that it also depends, quote, upon forces outside of their control, unquote. In such issues, misunderstandings are multiplying because the Cold War generations are passing away fraying the civil society bonds that once underpinned the transatlantic relationship. Although Europe no longer rules the world, it is too early to write off the old continent as a global player completely. To be true, the EU is not a military force and may never become a superpower due to its cultural diversity. But Europe's cultural dynamism made a central contribution to the rise of the modern world. With 450 million prosperous inhabitants, the EU also remains a trading block with a global reach. Moreover, the continental lifestyle is so attractive that millions of refugees are desperate to move there. Finally, the EU and its members are essential defenders of democratic governance and guardians of human rights. While the world wars have reduced Europe's power and populism is testing its resolve, the continent continues to play a constructive role around the globe. What can we conclude from this brief 
survey. In the face of such multiple challenges, Europe has shown a surprising resilience during the last generation. While the crisis of sovereign debt, migration, and Brexit quickly dispels the post-communist euphoria, the EU refused to crumble as its detractors predicted. But in spite of such strengths as competitiveness, social solidarity, and environmentalism, Europe also failed to live up to hopes for closer integration. Nonetheless, it has gradually emancipated itself from US tutelage and developed its own version of Western values, thereby reversing the transatlantic relationship. No longer trying to copy the quote American way of life, unquote, Europe has created a model of its own whose best practices might offer some inspiration for progressive politics in the United States. A first European trait worth considering is the adoption of a truly democratic election system in order to encourage citizen involvement. In contrast to the vote suppression and rule of overrepresentation of the American quote winner takes all unquote process, proportional representation more accurately reflects the wishes of the electorate by making all the ballots count, even of smaller parties. In contrast to the money-driven American campaigns, European parties are more often supported by public funds. Since this system reflects minority views, it leads to a higher participation during election. The broader range of voices represented in parliament favors coalition governments which tend towards centrist policies. Proportional voting requires complex negotiations, but it does make for better government in the long run. A second exemplary aspect is the generally peaceful international behavior of a Europe which has learned the lessons of two internecine wars. While members still cling to national sovereignty and foreign and security policy, their cooperation in the EU is an attempt to avoid the repetition of earlier bloodshed. Brussels speaks with a more united voice in matters of global trade, favoring a balance between free exchanges and protection of its own market. The European states are heavily involved in international organizations such as the WTO, supporting the liberal world order that has emerged after World War II. With the exception of the Yugoslav Wars, this preference for negotiation has pacified Europe and reduced tensions in other crisis regions, even if it had occasionally to be supplemented by force. A third worthwhile characteristic of the European model is the welfare state, which creates a sense of social solidarity. Since UK neoliberals have prevented the Europeanization of social policy, it has largely remained a preserve of the member states. Moreover, the return to a market ideology fostered by middle-class tax reward has led to a considerable retrenchment in government services. But far from collapsing, the welfare state has been reformed moving from subsidizing wage replacement to enabling recipients to re-enter the job market through additional policy has continued, absorbing almost half of the budget of most European states. These traits of the European model constitute a progressive alternative which is what I'm claiming, because they provide a better quality of life than the celebrated, quote, American dream, unquote. The latter offers perhaps higher incomes, bigger houses, grander SUVs, but this is purchased by job insecurity, social inequality, racist violence, and a rampant pandemic. Europeans prize their social safety nets such as, quote, access 
for all to childcare, medical and parental leave from work, tuition-free college, a living stipend, universal health care, and generous pensions, unquote. Such benefits require paying higher taxes, but they also provide greater services that make life more agreeable. Those Americans who want to enjoy similar advantages can develop their own version by selective borrowing from the continent. Far from collapsing, Europe in its best sense has become a model for progressive politics. Thank you. Thank you, Konrad Jarosz. This is uh, certainly the strangest moment as we transition without clapping everybody in the silence of their rooms. Um, we have two commentators and I'll very, very briefly introduce them so that we get to their commentary and then uh, to your questions. Again, feel free to put them in the chat and I'll try to uh, take them from there. Our first commentator is Helga Welch, who comes to us from uh, Wake Forest University, where she is professor of politics uh, and international affairs. Her publications have focused on the history and politics of the former East Germany, German unification, transitional justice, the reform of higher education in Germany, and democratization processes in Germany and Central Europe. She's published a book on denazification in the former East Germany and co-edited a book on German unification. Her most recent book, which she co-authored with Christiane Lemke, is Germany Today, German Politics and Policies in a Changing World that came out in 2018. And Helga, if you could unmute yourself, I can't see you on my screen right now. Okay, I unmuted myself. Can you hear me? Okay, very good. So thank you for the invitation. I'm truly honored to comment on Konrad Jarosz's lecture today. Uh, and I think I can speak for all of us. Uh, we are in Conrad's debt. Um, the main arguments and ideas embedded in his lecture are, of course, based on a thorough understanding of the past, but they're also forward-looking. And his lecture, as he said, uh, comes, and his book manuscript, uh, come with a political agenda, and this agenda is very timely, and not only because Chancellor Merkel has just set out Germany's vision for the council presidency just an hour ago. Uh, so Conrad's uh, latest work is unflinching, even bold in its intent. He sets out to defend Europe against its critics in the United States and in Europe without, however, bypassing the many challenges that Europe faces. Nevertheless, his work is a refreshing uh, break from the doom and gloom literature that is so often associated with Europe and in particular the European Union. The various dialectics of diversity and unity in Europe, the European Union, and to some extent in the transatlantic relationship are at the core of Conrad's project. In addition, as we heard, he suggests institutional and policy changes to the United States uh, based on the European experience. And it is indeed this uh, last aspect of his lecture that I will comment on. In other words, I will focus on the progressive alternative. In doing so, however, I will also uh, briefly address the concept of uh, Europe. Few would question that the United States is in dire need of reform. Popular discontent is high. The most recent Pew Research Center survey indicates that 71% of respondents feel angry about the state of the nation and 66% fearful. Only 17% are proud of it. Uh, however, 46% are hopeful about its future. The problems are manifold and known. I can only scratch the surface here. Gridlock and polarization have weakened institution, institutions. The health of the American democracy is in question. Fundamental is the lack of trust 
across the partisan divide. The credibility of the free press is being doubted, as is the fairness of the electoral process. It is against this backdrop that Conrad proposes lessons from Europe. So my question is, when we suggest les lessons, what is our intent? There are at least three possible answers, and they are not exclusive. One idea is to defend, and even more so, explain European practices against critics in the United States. For example, with regard to the different understandings of sovereignty or the civilian power concept. Here, the hope would be that a better understanding will positively influence transatlantic relations. Secondly, we can look to Europe or more precisely, individual public policy practices in Europe to frame and enrich policy debates in the United States. For example, in discussions about overhauling the healthcare system or uh, childcare or parental care. Finally, we can make concrete recommendations that aim at some form of policy transfer. If this is the case, then we need to assess the probability of adoption. That is, what may be desirable on a normative level may not be feasible on the empirical level. No matter which one of the options we choose, and maybe we want all three, it is imperative to ask, what is Europe? The concepts of Europe and Europeanization carry multiple normative and practical discursive meanings, even if the standard answers are shared culture, values, traditions, historical experiences, with war being a particularly prominent vehicle of Europeanness in the 20th century. But as the political scientist Richard Rose once wrote in answer to this very question of what is Europe, we need to know that, beginning of quote, locating Europe on a map is a test of political values. Where we look depends upon what we are looking for. In doing so, the idea of Europe turns into a more selective Europe, which I think in Conrad cases, case entails a heavy dose of German and Scandinavian components. In other words, Europe is not a neutral idea or concept, but serves as umbrella for the many Europes. And we can select different templates with the goal of locating its best practices. There are European ideas and principles, liberal democracy, human rights, civilian power, social market democracy, welfare state. And then there is the implementation that has demonstrated that Europeanization and membership in the European Union only go so far. And, your, and Conrad has pointed this out. In terms of public policies, there is no single model, but there is a diversity of experiences. While all European countries feature a universal healthcare system, the specifics differ. For example, when the United States looks toward models to reform its healthcare system, it looks predominantly to Canada, Taiwan, and yes, Germany. In similar fashion, the social market economy appears in a variety of forms and has mutated in important ways in the last decades, and the social elements vary. The range is quite broad, spanning a spectrum from the soft and governmental neoliberalism in Germany, and I thank Paul Nolte uh, for the introduction and exploration of these terms to several other models, depending on, yes, again, where we look. Conrad is not alone in his call for lessons from Europe to the United States, yet framing policy proposals with reference to the United States is, as we know, fraught with difficulties. I suggest three main reasons, political discourse, past dependence, and case selection. I start with the political discourse. As Conrad reminds us, Europe has become a dirty word for many Americans, mostly on the Republican side. 
But let me interject briefly. It is equally correct that the United States has become a dirty word for many Europeans, and not only since Donald Trump was elected to the presidency in 2016. Both sides pick and choose their examples. In the United States, for those on the right, it is Europe's low economic growth, high unemployment, the excesses of the welfare state, and yes, high taxes. Europeans criticize the United States' love affair with guns and hard power, U.S. unilateralism, entrenched social inequalities, a weak social safety net. I could continue with both lists. Yes, uh, yet nevertheless, the reality is more complicated. Throughout history and, into, and until today, Europe and the United States have defined themselves against each other but also in relationship to each other. Atlantic crossings, to borrow a book title by Daniel Rogers, or selective borrowing, to use Conrad's term, have defined the transatlantic relationship. Policy learning, both positive and negative, has been the norm. Today, the question is, can we sustain and extend these learning experiences. Let me briefly turn to the concept of past dependence. And in the interest of time, uh, I will simply say that clearly it matters and policy learning and policy transfer, transfer can only flourish under specific conditions. We find institutional stickiness everywhere. However, there are also windows of opportunity that can shake up the customary equilibrium. Yet, I should also say the political system in the United States is deliberately designed to be different from others. A myriad of veto players make change difficult and favors the status quo. It is conservative by design. Let me turn to my last point, the case selection. The parameters for innovation and reform are confined. But maybe, just maybe, there is more than a whiff of change in the air in the United States. Just this past Sunday, the New York Times presented a list of no less than 16 proposals how society, economy, and democracy can be reforged, that's their term, in the United States. What unites the proposal is the fact that they can build on a flexible and increment, incremental adaptation of policies or legislative bills, many of which already had been introduced in the past or have been implemented selectively at the local and state levels. In this spirit, I suggest taking the ideas that Conrad advances moderation instead of polarization, higher voter participation, an extension of the social safety net, as well as policies that favor multilateralism, and ask to what extent they can be expanded uh, to the United States. For example, it may be possible to increase voter turnout and lessen political polarization by, for example, reforming the Electoral College putting limits on gerrymandering and campaign spending, dedicating a national voting holiday, instituting automatic voter registration rather than uh, pro promoting voter suppression. Other examples could be added. Konrad Yarash has offered us a sweeping account of the last 30 years at a time when Europe and the United States face multiple challenges both old and new. He has presented a stimulating account that invites discussion. I talk mostly about the progressive alternative. In closing, I will refer to the main title, embattled. The term embattled Europe not only alludes to conflicts and problems, but can also imply the act of fighting back. And I suggest it applies to both Europe and the United States. I read Conrad's latest work 
as an endorsement for change in both settings. The agenda is to advance a social, just, fair, and peaceful liberal democracy. Ideally, such an agenda could be freed from ideological burdens and suggest a path toward workable and forward-looking solutions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Helga Welch. And in the transatlantic spirit of uh, this event, I will now introduce Pauli Neute from the Free University, who is a professor of modern and contemporary history there, teaching on the history and theory of democracy, on intellectual history, urban history, and perhaps particularly uh, germane to today's proceedings on the history of Germany and the US in transatlantic perspective. He has published broadly on democracy and liberalism, as well as on the work of other eminent historians, such as Hans Ulrich Wieler and Thomas Nippadai, and he serves on the steering committee of the Berlin program. Paul Neute. Um, unmute myself, okay. Thank you, Johannes. Uh, thank you, Conrad, uh, very much for this lecture. Thanks for the chance. I also feel honored to be able to talk here for a few minutes, but um, briefly, uh, I guess, so that we can move into a discussion afterwards uh, rapidly. Yes, this was uh, a sweeping and insightful overview of a scholar with uh, astonishing productivity, with accelerating productivity. The only hope for someone like me uh, is that retirement will come uh, and uh, perhaps with it the chance to write more books and articles, uh, to think more like Conrad does. Uh, but the astonishing fact also is that Conrad is not even retired. So he does it all. Uh, a big applause from my side also uh, for the typical Conrad Jarausch approach that we saw here. Uh, not just uh, a flight uh, above the cloud, a flight in the skies, but an insightful lecture full of facts, uh, full of quotes and citations, full of empirical material, and uh, yet with a clear interpretive uh, gist, uh, a, fine, a very fine example of the uh, history of the present uh, that you've been uh, alluding to, Conrad, in your talk, and that's, uh, yeah, a typical uh, Conrad Jarosz, and we look forward to uh, reading the book. Um, and I agree very much that something is wrong with uh, Europe and the United States, and not just politically in climate, depending on presidents coming or going, but structurally and as a historical divergence uh, of both sides in the transatlantic relationship that has uh, been developing over the past, uh, not just years, but decades. And yet for the sake of discussion, I will concentrate on a few points of critique, uh, perhaps um, fully aware, of course, uh, that I can at most uh, serve uh, with this uh, commentary as a sort of an uh, vaad advisor to the uh, great scholar who has given the lecture and written the book. Um, my first point is uh, that, uh, in my view, there should a little bit more emphasis be placed uh, on shared problems of Germany and the United States. Yes, these shared problems were present, but uh, the antagonism, the difference, the divergence uh, came first. Uh, and I think uh, there are many shared problems still uh, of uh, Germany, of Europe and uh, North America, the United States. Um, one of it uh, certainly is uh, the common agenda of uh, positioning the West or what used to be the West vis-a-vis uh, -vis a new world order, vis-a-vis -vis China. That's a common challenge, uh, for example, of uh, Europe and the United States, uh, certainly. But much more, I'm thinking of domestic problems that uh, both countries or regions share domestic problems, uh, for example, coming from socioeconomic transformations, domestic problems rooted in the nature of post-industrial societies, be it uh, in northern France or be it in the Great Lakes region uh, in the United States or in Saxony or in the Ruhrgebiet or wherever you have it in uh, Europe. And uh, these uh, domestic socioeconomic transformations have engendered problems in the United States and in Europe, new inequalities, political repercussions uh, in populism uh, that are close to one another and not so much describing uh, different worlds or worlds uh, apart by an ocean. 
I found uh, for uh, someone who still is uh, a European or who used to be a European, there was an amazing degree of idealization of Europe, uh, indeed, in your uh, lecture, in your paper, uh, Conrad, and of the course that European history has taken since uh, 1990. And I would try to insert a little bit more of a critical view vis-a-vis uh, -vis the development of Europe uh, in the um, uh, period of the last uh, three decades. Uh, there are, for example, uh, and you know uh, it is uh, uh, that way, there are connections between the triumphant phase and the redeemer phase in Eastern Europe on the one hand, that is the, the glorious period of the 1990s, uh, and uh, on the other hand, the backlash phase uh, since the uh, 2000s and 2010s on the other hand. And in Poland, for example, we can see this very clearly. And uh, just to mention a second point, not all is well with European politics, with European party systems, with European or German coalition governments, even in uh, Germany um, that has moved recently and which I find is at least an ambivalent development has moved from uh, the Westminster uh, um, democracy model to uh, the Swiss model of consociational democracy to the hyper grand coalition without really having a true uh, opposition or with leaving the opposition role to the AfD. That's a critical uh, development in German and uh, European politics that one could set against uh, your examples of uh, crises in American uh, democratic structures. So there is a little bit uh, too much black and white, too much good and bad in the picture that you've drawn, I'd say. Uh, it would be easy if the United States was really rotten, but the but the problem is it is not, and that makes it more complicated. Yeah, The United States is not overall a rotten country. Uh, it would be easy to do away with it if it was. Um, for example, there is uh, a true ambivalence, and I'm saying ambivalence. Uh, there is an ambivalence in the um, matter of wealth, prosperity, and life chances that you've dealt with uh, explicitly in the comparison between the United States uh, and Europe. Yes, there is more inequality, of course, we know that in the United States, Gini measured or otherwise. But uh, the advantage the United States still has in gross domestic cap, uh, uh, product per capita uh, is uh, astonishing. Um, it's uh, twice uh, the figure of Poland. Oh, no, did I say twice the figure? It's four times, more than four times the figure of Poland. And let's take Poland as a typical example of the European in Union and not so much Germany that implicitly or uh, often explicitly you've uh, mostly uh, looked at. And uh, would one really want to live in some marginal region of uh, the southeast of Poland or in, of course I'm being provocative a bit, uh, or in um, Prince George's County, Maryland, one of the wealthiest uh, African-American majority countries uh, in the United States. And that's not about the chances of the few, but that's about the chances of the mass of the people that is expressed uh, in these figures. The United States, uh, furthermore, is still uh, a global leader in technology and culture uh, on a wide range from the internet to sexual politics. Um, and that means not just uh, in capitalism, but in progressive thought. The United States is the world leader in progressive thought and not Europe, in my opinion. In progressive thought, culture, and new movements, it is the seedbed not only of advances in technology and markets, but indeed of progressive thought and practice. There is racism like we've all seen, uh, we've all seen in the past weeks with the George Floyd uh, killing, but there's the emergence of, and the re-emergence of Black Lives Matter which uh, poses critical questions to European nations for themselves, rather than having Europeans say, hey, Americans, look at us Europeans, you're racist, we're not. Oh my gosh, European countries, and you know that's the case very much for Germany, are so racially homogeneous and so implicitly racist that they can hardly serve as a model for, your, uh, for the United States uh, in that case and in many others. So there's a little bit of skepticism, I would say, towards uh, the reversal theory that uh, the paper uh, advances, the reversal theory meaning historically America, America in the post-war 
era has been a role model for Europe. And now it's time for a reversal. Now it's about the other way round. From Goethe's, as David Barclay already said, from Goethe's America, du hast es besser, to Conrad's uh, Europe's, you're so much better. Goethe, after all, expressed a cliche, a trope, and we should be careful not to, reprodu uh, not to produce new social tropes in the face of a much more complicated, as I see it, reality. And finally, I think we might put more emphasis on sources and potentials for renewal within the United States from its own traditions, from its own trajectory or in its own trajectory or in the past dependencies uh, of uh, United States institutions and history that Helga Welsh has spoken about. That's also more realistic and much more likely than the US um, switching to European trajectory and uh, um, 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 remodeling its political system after uh, proportional representation. And it may already start with a change in the White House after the November elections. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paul Neute. Um, I, I, I think it's only fair to give uh, Konrad uh, a, a minute or two to respond at least to one or two points that you pick out. There's probably more than you can do justice to very briefly. The questions are coming in in the chat, so I want to air those too. Um, but why don't you, if you want to just pick up a, a couple points, Konrad, and then we'll go to the chat. Yeah, let me start with intent a little bit. This is clearly, you know, not a monograph. Uh, what I was trying to do is speak to the younger generation of Americans uh, that came up uh, in the uh, uh, pre-election campaigns and so on, where I had a sense that they are looking for solutions and they don't know that some of the solutions are in front of their own noses uh, because of uh, a kind of domestic uh, focus. Uh, and my image of Europe, of course, is plural. I, you know, the structure of the book on which this talk is based is such that each chapter starts with a different place and a different anecdote and so on, just in order to get the plurality uh, across. There may be, you know, a kind of uh, idealized Europe uh, in the text, um, just like I think in Paul's comment, there is an idealized uh, America. Uh, I would have um, agreed slightly more, uh, you know, before the last several weeks uh, of the uh, racial conflicts and the pandemic disaster. It's not just a matter of replacing Trump. Uh, of course, we all hope that this will be the case and some of us are spending money on it uh, as well. Uh, but, you know, there is, I think, uh, a somewhat uh, deeper um, divergence. And yes, uh, you know, this is a, a text spoken to younger Americans who have little connection with Europe rather than the text spoken to Europeans. There's a long agenda of things that can be done and should be done on the European side in order to live up to uh, the European ideals. Uh, so uh, I don't think, you know, I'm completely naive on this one. Um, I'm certainly indirectly speaking to the progressive uh, side of opinion in the United States. And in order to suggest alternate possibilities have not you know, done as much as I should have uh, in uh, looking for indigenous sources uh, of American reform and change uh, I will think about that for the final revision uh, of the book. Uh, that's, I think, uh, a good point. And let me just break off my response right there. And Thanks. We, we have a lot of different kinds of questions coming in from very more specific to more meta ones. I, I thought I'd pick up first one that was actually retracted, but I, I'm going to, if it's okay, 
I think it's Julius Lagodny, I hope, I hope you have your name right, um, uh, uh, pose it anyway because uh, I think it, it puts another spin on a question that Paul Noita had, had put up. He asks, um, in a way I'd like to flip one of your questions. How might European countries learn from progressive ideas on the other side of the pond? Are there certain progressive policies or debates Europeans, in particular Germans, might need to incorporate from the US? And he's thinking about the debate around racism and bias within police forces in the US. As shown two days ago, German politics, thinking of Seehofer, are not even willing to discuss racial profiling and structural racism in its federal or state police forces. Similarly, we're often talking about xenophobia or Fremdenfeindlichkeit when non-white German or Muslim Germans are attacked and try to avoid the word racism, arguably excluding non-white Germans from the German conception of nation with far-reaching implications for non-white Germans. Germans of color are discriminated by both the society, where are you really from, the question that often comes up, and political institutions, racial profiling, especially within the federal po police forces. Institutions call themselves colorblind, but obviously are not. These are all terms, that's me now speaking, these are all terms that are debated heavily in the US, but maybe not so much in Germany. So the question is, when and how can Germans and Europeans introduce a less homogeneous view on their own people or nations, and how can we stop excluding people of color implicitly and explicitly in the public debate? I think that the progressive left in the US has done a much better job than any other European country. Uh, I'm sure the last statement is correct, except that of course it didn't make a whole lot of difference because over the 4th of July weekend, uh, over a dozen people got killed. Uh, and, you know, I don't have the same number in Europe over that weekend. Uh, I mean, you know, the point is, you know, I, I, there is, and Paul is also right, there is a very sophisticated debate uh, on uh, racism, but the practice of racism in the American South is so deeply ingrained uh, that change of terminology from the infamous N-word to black and various other kinds of new terminology and so on. And the tearing down of statues are not going to make it. This is a culture change that is going to require decades, uh, if not half centuries. Uh, and so I am responding also somewhat to my, not sort of to the debate of what American intellectuals would like their country to be, but rather what is the current record. Uh, and um, the uh, question is formatted in such a way that it sort of reminds me of the proconsul situation of Americans trying to fix Germans after 1945. And in many ways they have contributed to the after Hitler re-civilizing of Germans uh, and so on. Uh, but much of this has run out because the American example itself is highly problematic uh, these days. And we all would like um, the American intellectuals version of America to be true. The question is just how do we get there? And I was not you know, trying to solve the American problem with a text on Europe, that's kind of not very smart because it wouldn't work, but rather to get to attack stereotypes on Europe in the American media and in the American public uh, in order to create space for the progressive discussion. We have two questions that deal with, uh, touch on electoral politics uh, like you did in your talk. The first comes from Belinda Davis who asks, um, I certainly find proportional representation appealing, but how would that work with a non-parliamentary system as opposed to other possible alternative forms such as instant runoffs? Or are you thinking that it would require a transformation to a parliamentary system? I would probably assume the latter, and Helga is, I'm sure, also right, that the likelihood of that happening is not all very great. It's just I have so much problem with 
gerrymandering and with American courts and their lack of one person, one vote as a basic definition of democracy. When you have a terrific electoral system, long dash for the late 18th century, okay? It was one of the most advanced ones at the time, but we have a couple hundred years or more of development in the meantime, and we have all sorts of uh, lack of uh, participation and blockages, and we have all sorts of rollback, we have the experience of reconstruction, and we have a minority government out of the last two president, last several presidents, two of them, uh, you know, Gore, you know, and Hillary Clinton had a majority of the public vote and did not uh, become president and so on. And I don't quite see that this is sort of the democracy to go around the world and preach to everybody else to be democratic. I'm sorry. It's just out of a long frustration. A, a differently angled uh, uh, electoral question, this one about Europe uh, coming from Donna and addressing Konrad, but also Hega and Paul, um, asking, to, asking you all to comment on the electoral difficulties of social democratic and labor parties across Europe, whether you have any comments on that. Well, I mean, a quick comment, of course, would be that much of the agenda has been taken over by centrist and even right of center parties uh, so that social democracy in Europe in many places has lost its raison d'etre and the classic labor background of high industrial uh, workforces, trade unions and so on has also weakened so that the clientele on which uh, the social democrats could rely you know, has shrunk in the last years. Uh, so that needs uh, new thinking. And, you know, I guess my sense of the trade unions is they're still trying to hang on to an old uh, high industrial model. Uh, and as long as they keep doing that, uh, and as long as they don't really engage also, issues of migration and racism and so on, uh, their voting totals will continue to shrink. Mm. Can, I add one? Can I add one sentence uh, uh, here? Yes, electoral difficulties, uh, uh, well, uh, I should say, it, I would describe it more as a splintering of the left. Yeah, in, the, in Germany, of course, we have the emergence of the Green Party and in recent polls, the Green Party has overtaken the Social Democrats. In Southern Europe, we have the classical Social Democratic parties and more leftist parties like uh, Podemos in Spain or Syriza uh, in uh, Greece. Uh, and uh, perhaps it adds up to not much less uh, than it used to be. And in that uh, light, um, uh, the uh, party system of the United States still has a great advantage and the Democratic Party indeed has a great advantage because it can build uh, the coalition that uh, um, leftist parties in Europe uh, are or have become unable uh, to build. Um, the coalition, uh, however strenuous it is, um, uh, from Biden uh, to Sanders uh, is what the SPD was able to integrate um, between uh, Schmidt and Lafontaine four decades ago. Let's hope it will work. Yeah. yeah. Helga, did you want to also join in? Yeah, I mean, I think everything pretty much has been said, you know, that changing class structures, uh, changing value structures, uh, the opening of the left. I think one should also say that uh, the radical right or the right, however you want to call it, is, I think Conrad alluded to, has taken up um, some of the agenda of the uh, welfare policies. Like when you look at Poland, for example, or Hungary, they are using kind of welfare nationalism as their uh, points um, uh, to sell to the, uh, to the electorate. And of course, the emergence of the neoliberal consensus, however defined, um, clearly has also frustrated many voters um, on the left uh, with the third way and beyond. I have, I have two more questions in the chat that I'm going to combine because they strike me as somewhat sort of meta questions. 
Um, the first one is from Hartmut Kelble, who liked the talk very much, and asks, what is the purpose of the European model? And then offers three possible answers. Is it A, an element of transatlantic debate? Is it B, a proposal for European self-understanding? Or is it C, a concept of giving the EU a voice in the global public? And I, I combine this with the next question by Gabriela Stoitzea, who, uh, because she, uh, she asked the question uh, whether one could perhaps reflect the topic on another meta level. Here's what she writes. Rather than trying to reverse hierarchies and models between Europe and the US, wouldn't it be more productive to put what we are living through right now in the more neutral terms of the history of transatlantic relations and to think of ways in which this moment of crisis might be overcome other than by one side of the Atlantic imitating the other. Okay, I mean, I'm certainly not asking one side to imitate the other. I'm just looking for a more equal level dialogue across the Atlantic uh, again, because the American right is breaking off any kind of dialogue at all. And it is also interfering, uh, the alt-right is intervening in European populism. So, you know, this is really a set of transatlantic front uh, lines, which is less about Europe as Europe and America as America than it is about the progressive struggle with various forms of populist reaction. And, you know, Hartmut Kelbler's uh, very sophisticated uh, uh, suggestion, uh, I think it would be important to think about all of these uh, dimensions. And, you know, the very concept of a, a European model is something that, you know, comes out of what used to be called an American model. And my point has just been uh, that, um, this, they are no longer uh, coterminous uh, and um, that if the Europeans define somewhat more what they are about, they may be then to be able to become a kind of partner in transatlantic discourse. That is, I think, where the solution lies and not in in pro-consul Americans telling Europeans what to do and Europeans playing the old Greece versus Rome game, um, you know, uh, assuming that they're culturally superior and therefore the Americans must do what Europeans say. So there, there, the questions are continuing to come in, but I am going to close the chat um, because we have one more uh, item of business to get to. Um, but maybe I'll, I'll close with a speculative question that Mark Castle asked, whether you saw the present moment in Germany and Europe as closer to the Federal Republic in 68 or Weimar in the 1920s? Okay, well, I, I don't, you know, the Weimar analogy is one that is always brought out, uh, you know, when people, you know, in the movie theater cry fire. And my sense is they have cried fire so many times already uh, that, you know, a very simple reference to that is not working. Uh, and to 68, I can only say that my older son accused me of not getting my act together because he would have liked to have been 18 years old in 1968, but uh, he was born in 1970. Uh, so he was not able to experience uh, that. I think there is an element of 68, uh, the the radical democratic one, uh, that is worth recovering. But there are other elements of 68. Uh, you know, I am personally not into sex, drug, and rock and roll. Uh, that may be an admission that I should not make in public. Uh, but uh, you know, that or the various car groupings and so on. I, I don't think that that is going to lead us further. I think we have to think in, in other ways to try to formulate a progressive agenda on both sides of the Atlantic. 
Thank you very much, Konrad Yarosh. I'll pass on the other questions, or you probably have them in your chat, but I can pass them along to you too if you want to respond to Scott Kalza and uh, Kimberly Redding, who also had questions. But for now, um, I'd like to pass the screen back to Herbert Grisop for a slightly different purpose. Okay. Um, it's my task now um, to say thank you to one particular person. And as I mentioned earlier, today's GCA, uh, GCA Distinguished Lecture is the eighth lecture in the series, which we started in 2013. And the first speaker was Professor David Buckley, who you all know is the executive director of the GCA, and until recently was also Margaret and Roger Sheldon Professor of International Studies at Kalamazoo College. And he's also the author of numerous publications on German and Prussian history, and the recipient of many awards and fellowships. And today's lecture, and that's why I'm talking here, will be the last one where we will have David Barclay in his capacity as executive director. He will be retiring at the end of this year, and we, we would like to take a minute to reflect on David's contribution to this program. And um, David has been the GTA's executive director since 2006. In this capacity, he has worked with eight GCA presidents. So Johannes Molke, you are just one of one of eight. <laughs> and he was involved in many path-breaking changes in GCA. And I don't want to go into that. I want to focus today on his cooperation with us in our program here in Berlin. He has shaped developments that have uh, clearly strengthened the Berlin program. And uh, two of the things uh, in 2004, the GCA invited us to have our fellows and alums submit a panel to the annual conference, which we are now organizing every year, and that's, of course, Karin Goy, who's doing that marvelously. Uh, in 2013, we also launched the Distinguished Lecture Series, uh, featuring outstanding research, and uh, David has kindly agreed then to be the first speaker. He was also instrumental in securing funding from the Max Carter Foundation, for two additional postdoc fellowships, which we have now received for four cohorts, um, which is, of course, fantastic. It has really added to the program. And in addition to all this, David has always shared his time and expertise with the program very freely. He has led the colloquium, for example, in the summer of 2007, when he was a fellow at the American Academy, or uh, during a visit to Berlin not so long ago, in November 2018, David, together with Scott Krause, offered, for example, a city walk to all our fellows, which explored historical sites, particularly in West Berlin. And this was also the talk. Uh, this was the subject of David's talk in uh, 2013, Old Glory und Berliner Bär, the USR on West Berlin. And this talk brings us to another point. Um, his deep connections to the city, to the Freie Universität, to the Alliiert Museum, to name just two institutions. And um, I was told by Karin Goll that his ties to Berlin are much more than academic. She told me that he even has met his wife in Berlin and got, got married at the Standard, Standesamt Zehlendorf, which is um, around the corner from here. So basically, uh, what I'm saying is, um, David's successor has some very big shoes to fill. And in these, um, yeah, in these difficult times, normally would, we would have given you a nice uh, present uh, and uh, we, would, we would have done something nice and hand over something. But what all we have now is a virtual card. And, oh, okay, the technique seems to work. Johannes is sort of bringing in a technical car, a technical little thingy. There it is. It's a technical card. And what we want to say is we urge you to keep your coffer in Berlin. And now I think there might be even some music, right? No, we, for, we had to forego the music for technical. It would have been too complex. So you have to imagine either Marlene Dietrich or Hildegard Knef, choose one or uh, mash them up singing Wunderschön ist in Paris auf der Rue Madeleine. <laughs> I, have, I have CDs of both. <laughs> there you go. So yeah, Karin tried to uh, convince some of us to sing here on Zoom, but we thought that that's, you know, we wouldn't, 
we weren't sure whether that's a gift or a threat. So uh, we, we keep it as it is uh, with, with a thank you card from the Berlin program. Thank you very much for all your contributions. Thank you very much for, for all that you've done to the program. Normalerweise bin ich nicht sprachlos, aber ich bin diesmal doch sprachlos. Also Sprachlosigkeit kommt bei mir selten vor. Und jetzt ist das doch der Fall. Vielen, vielen herzlichen Dank. Ich bin ganz berührt, bin ganz bewegt. Vielen herzlichen Dank, Herbert. Vielen herzlichen Dank, Johannes. Vielen Dank. Vielen Dank zu allen. Vor allem. Und äh, 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 Sie haben recht, äh, ich habe meine Frau in Berlin kennengelernt. Äh, und zwar in der Knesebeckstraße im Goethe-Institut, man höre und staune. Äh, ich werde immer noch einen Koffer in Berlin haben, davon kann man ausgehen. Vielen, vielen herzlichen Dank. Super. Uh, yeah, dear David, come back. Uh, thank you for all your enthusiasm and the support for our program. We're looking forward to welcoming you back. I will pick you up at Dahlem Dorf <laughs> and then we will go on another Stadtspaziergang with fellows or have another cooperation with an interesting subject. And I will be amazed to actually see that new flughafen. It looks like yeah. it's actually going to happen. So That's for another day. Congratulations, yeah. David. My personal thanks to you as well. And thanks to all three speakers, Helga Welsh, Paul Neute, and Konrad Jarosch for very, very instructive uh, uh, hour and a half today that we were able to spend with you. Uh, and I hope the technology worked on everybody else's end. It seemed to be working on, on mine. Um, this may uh, be something we'll figure out a, a way to repeat, but I do look forward to actually uh, um, toasting uh, with actual wine glasses again in the, in the garden in Dadem. So in that spirit, um, uh, I wish everybody a lovely rest of the day in the US or a nice evening in Europe. Uh, and I look forward to seeing you all in another place. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you.